1961, computers were just emerging as a new technology. And one of the few places you could even find one was at the MIT University. During that same year, a student by the name of Steve Russell started work on a computer program that was revolutionary for its time. What he ended up creating was a video game called Space War. Now the game shown here is not an exact replica of the original, but it's pretty darn close. Space War is a two-player game that allows each player to take control of a tiny spaceship, and it becomes your mission to destroy the other player by shooting at him before he can destroy you. You also have to worry about this small dot in the center of the screen, which represents the sun. And if you accidentally touch it, you die. The game Space War was an instant hit around campus, but sadly, Steve wouldn't be able to make a dime off his invention since Space War just couldn't be marketed. While attending college, Nolan had become a huge fan of the game Space War and instantly realized the potential of what computer games could become. He first spent many months building a prototype of the game that would work on a TV rather than a computer. He then took the TV and built a fiberglass cabinet around it and placed the game's controls just below the screen. The very first coin-operated video game, and he named it Computer Space. Now dropping a quarter into this machine would buy you 90 seconds of playtime. In a one-player game, you take control of a spaceship, and it's your job to fly around the screen and destroy as many alien spaceships as you can before the timer runs out. But the two-player game, on the other hand, becomes an all-out dogfight between you and the second player. But this time, a point system has been added to the game. Miles away, another man by the name of Ralph Baer also had the idea of creating video games. But his idea involved creating a video game that could be hooked up to a television set at home. Ralph, who was a skilled engineer, spent a few years building the prototype of his idea. He took the device and showed it to the people at Magnavox. Being impressed with what they saw, they not only bought Ralph's invention, but also filed patents on the technology. Now the unit comes with two controllers, six game cards, and is powered by six C batteries. Now by plugging in card number one, we get to play a game called Table Tennis. And on the screen, we have four objects. A line that divides the screen, player one, player two, and the ball. The dial on the left moves you back and forth. The dial on the right moves you up and down. So basically the goal here is to try to knock the ball into the other player's court in hopes that it falls off the edge of the screen. If this happens, you win the round. To bring the ball back into play, however, the loser must press the reset button on top of the controller. Magnavox took steps to extend the life of the product, and they did this by adding in a whole shitload of accessories, like flashcards, dice, stickers, and about a dozen of these thin plastic overlays. You just place them onto the TV screen. So now instead of playing just a boring black and white game, we're now playing a black and white game with a stupid overlay on top of it. Moving on to the fifth card, we have a submarine overlay. The point in this game is to travel along the set path while avoiding the missiles that can be shot by the second player. A few weeks before the console was officially released, Nolan Bushnell was back with a brand new game, and after turning to the Japanese language for a company name, he ended up finding the perfect word. Atari. Nolan gave the engineer of his company, Al Acorn, the mission of building a game off the idea he had, and he wanted it to consist of three things. A ball, two paddles, and a scoring system. Al not only created Nolan's game, but also added in a few enhancements to make the gameplay more interesting. For example, the longer you play the game, the faster the ball starts moving. And you could bounce it off the sidewalls, as well as alter the return trajectory of the ball. With these enhancements in place, Pong was born. Within weeks, dozens of other companies started copying the exact same game and selling their own Pong machines. In the following months, Atari continued to expand their operation by releasing slightly altered versions of Pong, Pin Pong, Pong Doubles, Quadra Pong, as well as a few others. But Nolan kept looking for the next big idea, Space Race. Breaking away from the Pong formula, this game consists of two spaceships placed at the bottom of the screen, and the goal here is to reach the top before the other player does and you must do this while dodging obstacles like meteors, asteroids. A few months later, Atari released a third game called Gotcha. This two-player game is based on the concept of one player trying to catch the other while running around a maze that's constantly changing. Atari's next arcade game was called Rebound, and this was a Pong-like game that had the player's paddles 
placed along the bottom of the screen. The point here is to keep the ball from falling off your side of the screen. If you fail, the other player is then awarded a point. And if both players can keep the ball in play long enough, the middle divider will start increasing in height and raise the difficulty level. The next game released in March of 1974 was called Grand Track 10. The player takes control of a race car, and your mission is to drive around the track as you race against the clock. The last Atari game to be released in 74 was called Tank. This game consists of both players taking control of tanks and driving around a battlefield in order to blow each other up. Even though Tank had a very simple concept, it would become Atari's third popular game. And their next game, released in October of 75, was a horse racing game called Steeplechase. In this title, up to six players could compete in this game at the same time, while the seventh horse at the bottom of the screen was controlled by the computer. And Nolan Bushnell's next big idea was to conquer the home consumer market. And he planned on doing that by creating a home version of Pong that would plug into any television set. But this one was in color. After Atari released Pong, Magnavox was back with a brand new console called the Odyssey 100. The bottom two moved the player around the screen, while the third would put spin on the ball after hitting it. Also on the console is a manual scoring system, since the actual game just didn't have one. This game is just like Pong, but with more dividers to make it resemble a hockey rink. After only a few months, however, Magnavox was back yet again with the Odyssey 200, and this console added in two new features, like adding in extra paddles, and adding in a third game called Smash, where both players take turns hitting a ball against the wall. Atari fired back by releasing Super Pong, and this version had a total of four different Pong games. There was Pong, Pong Doubles, Off the Wall Pong, and Reverse Pong, where the object of the game is to actually let your ball reach your side of the screen. A new company called Exidy released a game in 1975 called Destruction Derby. The goal here is to drive around and smash into as many cars as possible. A follow-up game released a year later called Death Race would replace those other cars with stick figures, and after running them over, the player would hear this gruesome sound. Although Exidy had earned their 15 minutes of fame, it was actually Midway Games that ended up becoming a force to be reckoned with later that year. Their first game to become a hit was called Gunfight. Gunfight was actually the first game to be built with a microprocessor, and this was done to handle all the complex graphics happening on the screen. And one title that made an impact that year was a game called Breakout. This was another Pong-like game, but turned on its side, so the ball would knock out the blocks, resting high above. And interestingly enough, the game itself was actually engineered by Steve Jobs, who later went on to become the co-founder of Apple. A little company called Fairchild Camera and Instrument quietly released the Fairchild Channel F. And the main feature of this console allowed you to play completely new games by simply inserting a different video game cartridge into the machine, like Desert Fox, Blackjack, Tic-Tac-Toe, Drag Race, Maze, Quadradoodle, with the most popular being Pinball Challenge. The video game industry at this point was pretty much on its last leg, but if anyone could breathe life back into this market, it was Atari. And towards the end of 77, the console they were about to release was on a mission to do just that. <laughs> 